Yes. Um, so I want to welcome everybody to the uh, summer 2020 workshop final briefings. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is in 10 minutes, uh, five groups will be explaining first uh, their exploration of the science of a distinct environmental problem and of the solution uh, to that problem, the framing of a piece of legislation to address it. Um, they will have spent the summer working in groups together uh, with deadlines uh, and learning how to produce uh, this kind of uh, report uh, that we're going to hear about today and that very soon will be on the program's website. Uh, this uh, class had the unusual challenge of learning how to build team camaraderie and teamwork in cyberspace. Uh, I think we all learned a lot about how to work in this medium. There are certainly a lot of advantages to it, but there are, of course, some disadvantages. Um, next semester, uh, some of us hopefully will be uh, meeting face to face, at least in the individual parts. What we do next semester is we will be moving on to uh, pretending these bills have been passed and on January 1st, we have to implement them. So that's that's what we're doing in the workshop. The, the, uh, reports and the briefings that I've seen so far this summer have been extraordinary. And uh, so without further delay, let me introduce our first presenter who will be talking about advancing emergency preparedness uh, through the One Health Act of 2019, which is a group advised by Professor Louise Rosen. And so I'd like to introduce Russ Kuhner uh, to speak to you. Okay, Russ, unmute yourself, please. And tell oh, me how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> uh, Kuhner is good. Uh, All right. -E -R. Yeah, there used to be an umlaut uh, over the <laughs> U. It was German, uh, but we had a hard time finding work in this country early in the early days. You know, it said uh, for you know work for hire in the windows, no Germans. So we anglicized the pronunciation. <laughs> well, every immigrant group has that experience here. So yeah. some even worse. So let's begin. You got it. Um, Stephanie, do I have, oh, I'm controlling have control it. so you can practice moving it to the next slide. All right. So I, I clicked the screen. All right. I think we're good. And I'm ready to go. I can begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Russ Keener. I'm excited to be here sharing with you my team's work this summer on the advancing emergency preparedness through the One Health Act of 2019, also known as HR 3771. But first, I'd like to thank my team for all of their hard work to help us to get to this point, as well as I'd like to thank our faculty advisor, Professor Rosen, for all of her support. Uh, let's see, clicking, Stephanie. Hang on once again. All right, try again now. Yeah, there you go. Here we go. I'll begin with a brief introduction to zoonosis in the United States and then cover the science behind this environmental problem. I'll introduce our bill and the One Health framework and go on to detail the solutions the bill proposes. I'll outline several stakeholder controversies and wrap up with conclusion. In 1981, I was born into a world where a zoonotic disease epidemic was getting underway in the United States. This disease was HIV. Infections peaked at 150,000 cases in the mid 80s, and over 20 years, it killed over 450,000 Americans. As of 2019, annual federal funding for HIV in the United States is about $28 billion. Now noting that COVID-19 is easier to contract than HIV, it is staggering that today, the COVID-19 pandemic has killed nearly 160,000 Americans in less than a year. The US is currently leading the number of COVID deaths at around 23% of the world's total. As of April, the US government has spent more than $6 trillion to fight the coronavirus crisis, and 40 million Americans have applied for unemployment. The CDC estimates that zoonosis account for 75% of emerging infectious diseases 
with the rising contact between humans and animals, that percentage is only expected to grow. The main drivers of this growth are human caused. Urbanization and deforestation remove natural physical barriers between humans and pathogen carrying wildlife. For example, deer lose their natural homes. They move into urbanized areas, bringing ticks that carry Lyme disease with them. The livestock and wild animal trade place humans and animals in direct contact, directly exposing people to pathogens, as we saw with swine flu, H1N1. And climate change can create favorable conditions for vector spread zoonotics like malaria to expand by increasing warm and wet environments that are excellent places for mosquitoes to breed. For pathogens to make the jump between an infected animal and a human, they have to overcome three barriers. The interspecies barrier, which is the initial exposure between an infected animal and a human. The intrahuman barrier, where the pathogen is able to infect an individual and multiply. And finally, the intrahuman barrier, which means the pathogen can now be transmitted throughout the population. Now to reduce the likelihood of this jump occurring, the human drivers that are making this more likely require monitoring. Uh, the complexity and scale of this public health crisis requires the efforts of multiple government agencies to address not only human health, but animal and environmental health as well. And that's where HR 3771 comes in. The Advancing Emergency Preparedness Through One Health Act was introduced in the House in July 2019. With the goal was to advance federal efforts to prevent, prepare, and respond to zoonotic disease outbreaks using a One Health framework. This framework recognizes that human, animal, and environmental health are interrelated and promotes collaboration across various sectors and disciplines to help solve global health challenges. But One Health isn't a new idea. Health professionals have long understood that human, animal, animal and environmental health must be evaluated together or vital information is lost. In the case of emerging pathogens, this inhibits prevention and delays response. With the One Health framework, this bill specifically promotes interagency coordination and expands partnerships and capacity to respond to public health threats that can cause major uh, impacts to the economy, agricultural sector, and national security. Unlike PREDICT, a zoonotic disease uh, program that was launched by USAID and mainly run with non-federal partners, this framework instead is a more inclusive effort that requires coordination between many relevant federal agencies and outside partners, expanding capacity to achieve identified goals within a 10-year time frame. Under the Secretaries of Health and Human Services and Department of Agriculture, this bill directs agencies to identify and build upon existing and past efforts like PREDICT that investigate priority zoonotics and their transmission. By collaborating across departments and disciplines, Agencies like the CDC and FDA, who work on similar goals like health monitoring and vaccine development, can also share data to compare progress and accelerate prevention protocols. Agencies will also lead workforce development activities to improve on the ground response. Indicators of success for monitoring animal health include early detection of pathogens to promote reductions in both disease spread within animal populations but also reduce mortality rates. Ongoing domestic and international monitoring of livestock and, uh, and species within the wildlife trade is essential for early detection of zoonotic disease. In 2014-2015, the avian influenza outbreak in the United States led to the culling of nearly 50 million birds, a loss of 3.3 billion for the poultry industry. In this case, pathogen screening of domestic livestock carried out by the U.S. Department of Agriculture would greatly reduce animal mortality. Satellite monitoring of land use change is used to map and predict the emergence of infectious disease hotspots. These efforts help direct the application of wildlife health monitoring for early detection, and it can also be used to coordinate with local governments to mitigate deforestation, to help stabilize the environmental health of a region, International monitoring of both environmental and wildlife health, in this case, would be carried out by USAID. Providing early and sufficient testing capacity and contact tracing greatly limits the spread of pathogens. 
South Korea, a country with an existing disease response net network, was able to ramp up testing capacity to 10,000 tests a day within a month of government officials coordinating to have testing kits developed. Two months later, South Korea saw its first day with no new COVID-19 diagnoses. Here in the US, testing kit development and monitoring guidance is directed by the CDC. The complexities of preventing and responding effectively to emerging zoonotic pathogens poses diverse challenges. The keys to early detection and contact tracing requires the collection and sharing of health data. The One Health Bill calls for data sharing between federal agencies and global partners to monitor pandemic susceptibility of zoonoses. Some countries, agencies, or even individuals may be uncooperative due, for, due to proprietary or privacy concerns. In the US, for example, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, also known as HIPAA, is a potential barrier to collecting surveillance data on a national level, as South Korea did to, su to successfully respond to COVID-19. HR 3771's One Health Framework does not specifically consider the social dimensions that affect human, wildlife, and environmental health. For example, some people are dependent on bushmeat for their livelihoods or as their main source of protein, while others may believe it is to be a healthier, a healthier option than livestock. All these people would be adversely affected if bushmeat practices were banned. An incomplete understanding of the cultural, economic dependence on the wildlife trade, agricultural practices, uh, and hunting activities, as well as the absence of appropriate alternatives, can lead to unsustainable and inefficient One Health protocols that hinder progress. While there are many challenges that need to be considered and addressed, the One Health framework has the flexibility and adaptability uh, to greatly lessen both the direct and indirect public burdens of zoonotic disease. In summary, the number and frequency of zoonotic disease outbreaks are on the rise. Monitoring for in, uh, emerging diseases will help the US promote, will move away from merely reacting to outbreaks as they occur and move towards preventing them in the first place. To address the scope of the interconnectedness between uh, humans, animals, and environmental health, a collaborative One Health approach is needed to help keep Americans safe. By facilitating prevention, and early detection at the human, animal, and environmental interface, HR 3771 can help proactively reduce disease burdens, financial costs, and societal disruptions. Just imagine where we could be if this bill had been in place before the COVID-19 outbreak here in our country and across the world. Thank you. I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, do we have any questions? And yeah, very nice, very nice job, Russ. Uh, Stephanie, how are we doing question and answers uh, in this format? Yes, so you can either raise your hand um, and I can unmute you, or um, you can type it into the Q&A box or the chat box. So we'll give people a few moments to do either of those. Okay. Uh, All right, I'm not seeing any, so I think we can. Okay, well, then it looks like, uh, Russ, you got off easy today. So uh, congratulations and uh, very nice work. And uh, so we'll now move on to our second briefing. Uh, I think what we'll do is do uh, maybe three of them take a break and then do the last two. So the, the next group uh, is, uh, is uh, Professor Palmer's group, and uh, we'll be hearing from Drew Poling on the Agricultural Resilience Act. So Drew, if you're ready, uh, take it away. Uh, actually, I'll be the one presenting on the Agriculture Resilience Act. Okay, sorry. No worries. Okay. All right, Charlie, you should be able to click on the screen. Okay. Perfect. It says I'm controlling it. Got it. There we go. Okay, I'm just going to do it. Okay. Hello. My name is Charlie Sad, and I will be presenting today on behalf of the Agriculture Resilience Act team. 
Before I begin, I'd like to thank my team members for all their hard work, as well as our faculty advisor, Dr. Palmer, for all of his support. As it currently stands, the agriculture sector emits the most greenhouse gases after the energy sector. The Agriculture Resilience Act seeks to cut these emissions by 50% no later than 2030 and achieve net zero by 2040. While the bill offers a sweeping array of approaches to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions throughout the agriculture sector, for the purposes of this presentation, we will discuss two specific areas, soil carbon management and methane management. After describing the science and controversies associated with each management technique, we will touch up on some of the metrics used to measure the success of implementation. As you can see in this graph, the agriculture sector is responsible for over 9% of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Not only is this significant in its own right, it can represent an enormous challenge because only some facets of this problem are amenable to technological, technological fixes, while many others require entirely new land management practices. Directing our attention to the bar at the top of the screen, this graphic clearly demonstrates that the largest proportion of greenhouse gas emissions come from agricultural soil management practices that release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. While this is a formidable challenge, it is also an opportunity because changes in land management practices can actually result in a significant increase in the sequestration of carbon dioxide, which would be an incredibly important tool in the effort to combat climate change. The bill pays special attention to the emissions of methane associated with the agricultural sector. Methane is a greenhouse gas that has a global warming potential approximately 30 times greater than CO2. This means that its short-term effects on the climate and warming are quite significant. By the same token, any reduction in methane, even if it means converting it into CO2, can have an immediate outsized benefit with regard to the climate. For the purposes of this presentation, we will be focusing on the methane emissions associated with manure management. However, it is important to note that enteric fermentation or the methane produ produced during the course of a cow's digestive process is also a significant source of emissions. Let's begin our examination of the proposed solutions with the bill as they relate to soil carbon management. Pictured here is Lani Estill from Bear Ranch showing off some homemade compost. Lani raises cattle and sheep to produce wool for winter apparel companies such as the North Face. She's an avid practitioner of carbon farming, which takes local soil and climatic conditions into account to draw down as much CO2 from the atmosphere as possible. As Estill says, climate friendly farming is just being aware of the soil. Her compost is a combination of manure and wood chips that is spread strategically throughout the ranch in order to increase photosynthetic activity and turn carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. She also makes use of silvopasture, which is a land management technique that uses trees and shrubs as a grazing source in pastured areas. The use of compost and silvopasture have both increased soil organic carbon, which has many additional benefits such as increased water retention, boosted soil resiliency, and improved nutrition. One of the benefits of carbon farming is that soil organic carbon serves as an organic fertilizer. Agricultural practices that disturb the soil, such as tilling, planting monocrops, removing crop residues, excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides, and overgrazing, expose the organic matter in the soil to oxygen and microbes, allowing it to be emitted and respired into the atmosphere. Increasing soil organic matter means that plants will take more nutrients from the surrounding soil complex instead of becoming dependent on external fertilizer inputs. This supports healthy soil communities and reduces the need for fossil fuels used in the creation of synthetic fertilizers, lowering greenhouse gas emissions in addition to sequestering carbon. This photo shows another example of a soil management solution included in the bill, integrated crop livestock systems. The family owns a kerosene farm in southeastern Washington, utilizes cover crops after harvesting grain. Cover crops prevent erosion and soil degradation resulting from bare soil left between crop yields. Their sheep then eat the forage of the cover crop, turning it into milk for lambs and meat for local markets, all the while assisting with weed management and helping the soil system reutilize nutrients. Using an integrated crop livestock system averts issues that arise from industrial livestock systems, such as high water demand needed for livestock feed or rampant spread of pathogens. Soils can sequester large amounts of carbon dioxide and play an important role in mitigating climate change. With that being said, there are several limitations to this process. Although large amounts of carbon can be stored initially, soils can become saturated after 10 to 100 years depending on the climate, soil type, and how it is managed. With proper intervention, scientists estimate that soil carbon sequestration grew between 2 and 5 gigatons of carbon dioxide by 2050. 
While this is only 5 to 15% of the carbon currently produced by the energy sector, it will have a significant role to play in reversing climate change as emission levels begin to decline. Of course, much of this potential depends on local livestock and grazing practices, which can sometimes be detrimental to soil carbon. Setting that aside, if all the lands under human management sequestered the maximum amount of carbon possible, we could reduce atmospheric concentration of CO2 back to pre-industrial levels. Next, we will turn our attention to the proposed solutions within the bill to limit the methane emissions that result from anaerobic digestion. Let's begin our discussion of the use of anaerobic digesters with an example from a dairy farm in California. Carlos and Felix Echeverria are two second generation dairy farmers who were initially reluctant to spend extra money on monitoring their methane emissions, much less capturing them. That all changed when funds from California's cap and trade bill were used to sponsor a third party to build, operate, and maintain an anaerobic digester on their land. Now Carlos and Felix perform limited maintenance and earn regular payments for the biogas that they send to the grid. Anaerobic digestion is a biological process by which microorganisms convert organic material into biogas in wet and anoxic conditions. This biogas includes carbon dioxide and methane, each of which is released freely into the atmosphere without intervention. In this graphic, the organic material inputs are livestock waste, which are processed to generate biogas, as well as biosolids to be used as fertilizer or soil amendment. Anaerobic digesters capture the methane produced by open waste lagoons and turn it into energy. Anaerobic digesters can successfully prevent important amounts of methane from ever reaching the atmosphere. Critics, however, point out that the technology often costs millions of dollars to construct and almost always requires publicly backed financing in some fashion. This raises the question of whether it would be more appropriate to tax methane emissions rather than subsidize alternatives. Additionally, anaerobic digesters don't solve other environmental problems, such as the contamination of groundwater or the generation of local air pollution from the combustion of biogas. Each of these can pose a serious hazards for local communities, suggesting that policymakers should seek to phase out waste lagoons altogether rather than attempting to make them more environmentally friendly. Finally, more cost-effective alternatives do exist, such as pasture-based grazing, which avoids the problem of concentrated manure in the first place. Some argue that this livestock management method is inherently more benign and should be supported in lieu of concentrated feeding operations that produce large pits of animal waste. To understand the success of the Agriculture Resilience Act and determine whether or not the bill achieves its goal of a 50% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030, it is imperative to track both livestock production and the annual emissions associated from the agriculture sector. Tracking livestock production is an important means of estimating methane emissions. Existing data on production techniques and the numbers of livestock can be determined from the Department of Agriculture's county statistics. Additionally, the amount of methane emissions that have been avoided due to the use of anaerobic digesters can be determined by keeping track of the total number and capacity of digesters installed, as well as the total amount of energy that they produce. Finally, carbon accounting is a crucial method of keeping track of not only the emissions released into the atmosphere, but also the amount of carbon sequestered by the soil. Metrics such as the number of acres switched to integrated systems and monitoring efforts of soil carbon content all contribute to the larger picture of how successfully the bill is serving to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Addressing the emissions from the agriculture sector is only the first step in the transition towards a more sustainable food system. This bill prioritizes greenhouse gas reductions in the service of promoting human and animal well-being. The act also allocates extensive funding into the research and development of new crop breeds and land management techniques that will simultaneously help abate emissions and sequester carbon. Food waste is another area of concern where resources are needlessly squandered, and the bill outlines several actions to help solve this problem that we weren't able to touch on today. All told, the practices dis discussed today are crucial strategies to meet the goal outlined in the bill of cutting emissions in half by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2040. That being said, it is important to recognize that they are only part of a much wider set of solutions. Thank you, and I can take any questions now. Good job, Charlie. Um, do we have any questions? Actually, I'll ask a question while we wait for some questions to come in. Uh, my question is actually, uh, anaerobic digestion is also used uh, to process food waste in cities, uh, and which is a different use than the one that you're describing here. Uh, does does it make sense for that use as opposed to the use that you're describing uh, in terms of farming? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that it absolutely does make sense to use anaerobic digesters to reutilize the methane emissions produced from food waste. But food waste have a lot of implicit emissions associated with producing them in the first place. And so the best thing that you can do with regard to food waste is try to prevent it from happening in the first place. So it, it's a useful tool in the portfolio of approaches, but it's not sufficient to mitigate the emissions overall. Yeah. No, I was thinking as an alternative to landfilling, which is the other thing they do with, with uh, garbage in cities. So, oh, yeah, uh, that'd certainly be better than that. <laughs> okay, good, good response, Charlie. Any uh, other questions? Okay. We, have a, we have a question okay. from Jenny. Okay. Great job, Charlie. I also wanted to know about food waste, but Professor, I asked about that. Um, my other question was, you mentioned that an alternative to the anaero anaerobic digestion is um, just doing more pasture grazing farming. Um, did you look into just the impacts of, of that on land use? And, and is it possible um, to totally transition to that form of farming with the, without like with the amount of land we have available in the US? Yeah, that's a great question, Jenny. And so I'm not able to answer this to the degree of specificity that I would like, but the basic gist is that the CAFOs, the concentrated animal feeding operations that currently produce our meat, have so many external inputs, ultimately from fossil fuels, that it would be really challenging to achieve the same amounts of total meat production based off of the available amounts of land. With that being said, the use of pasture-based grazing is beneficial for several other reasons, namely that it can actually help to facilitate the storage of carbon in soils. And so if we were able to scale that up, particularly on marginal lands that could actually be restored to some extent, then it could potentially sort of achieve maybe perhaps the same magnitude, but I, I'm skeptical and I don't have the exact numbers, but I don't think it would be able to achieve the same amount of uh, meat output as the current system. So it's there are a lot of factors at play but to answer your question it couldn't really substitute in okay let's see if we can take one more question if we have one great we have two more questions so liz you're welcome to ask your question hi charlie great presentation um i have a question that kind of ties into what we were just talking about so anaerobic digesters um how does the scale of the benefits they provide compared to the scale of the problem and how much we need to reduce carbon compared to say um, switching to pasture-based farming or similar practices? Yeah, okay, so if we switch to pasture-based farming, that would be a driver of much more change because it's important to remember that the anaerobic digesters that are used on this land are only able to produce usable amounts of energy because there is such a vast amount of fossil energy available to create the fertilizers, the food inputs, and the, the operations that go together. So the amount of methane that you actually recapture and get back to the grid as a percentage of the total amount of fossil fuels that went in to produce that in the first place is really marginable, marginal and quite slim. And so it's never going to be an, an ultimate solution. It's really something to sort of alleviate the short-term effects of methane emissions, but there's no, there's no way that it could be um, seen as a sort of panacea to this issue altogether. Let's take that one, that fourth question that I heard about and, uh, and then uh, conclude. All right, so Allison says, great presentation, Charlie. My question is, does the effectiveness of these strategies to reduce carbon emissions for farmers vary depending on the climate where the farm is located? For example, are there differences between farms in the southern states versus northern states? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, some of the most, um, the highest prospects we have for storing carbon on the soils are actually in tropical regions because woody perennial plants that sequester the most amounts of carbon tend to proliferate in the, to the greatest degree there. That's not to say that at uh, more temperate latitudes, such as in the United States, you can't sequester carbon, but there are certainly differences and a lot of that does have to do with the water availability as well as the, year, the climate to facilitate year round growing seasons. So in general, the tropics are a little bit more conducive to soaring carbon and then the temperate latitudes slightly less so, although you can still make a sizable impact. Okay, thank you very much, Charlie. Wonderful presentation, great job group. Um, and uh, congratulations. So let's turn to our third briefing, uh, which is uh, for Professor Cook's group.
uh, on Wildlife Conservation Anti-Trafficking Act of 2019. And I hope that that'll be Tim. Uh, Tim Woodruff will be doing that briefing. Uh, and uh, if I got that right, Tim, why don't you begin? It is Tim, thank you. <laughs> All right, hello and welcome to my group's final briefing on HR 864, the Wildlife Conservation and Anti-Trafficking Act of 2019. My name is Tim Woodruff and I would like to thank my managers, Ariella Levy and Allison Day, as well as my team and especially our advisor, Dr. Cook. Before we go over the legislation, it's important to know that wildlife trafficking is the illegal gathering, transportation and distribution of animals and their products, such as horns, skins and bones. It includes local and regional poaching operations as well as distribution networks. This chart shows the evolution of wildlife trading from a local subsistence-based activity that became less sustainable with population growth, heightened human mobility, and more uses for wildlife. Today, there's an unsustainable and illegal wildlife trafficking sector which causes biodiversity loss and contributes to the spread of zoonotic or animal-based diseases. First, we will go over a case study of one of the world's most trafficked animals, the pangolin. Pangolins are native to Central Africa, India, and Southeast Asia, which are shaded in gray on this map. They are trafficked for their scales, which have perceived medicinal value in traditional medicinal practices. And after they are killed, traffickers remove their scales and the pangolins meat and blood are often sold as delicacies. However, there is a serious risk of coming into contact with body fluids, which may cause disease which may carry disease-causing microorganisms. As seen in this image, a scaling a pangolin with no protective equipment. This is referred to as direct animal-human contact and is a primary risk for zoonotic disease transmission. Studies have shown a potential connection between COVID-19 and pangolin trafficking, suggesting that pangolins may have played an intermediary role by carrying a mutated and infectious form of the virus between the original source and humans. In addition to the risks of zoonotic disease, removing pangolins from their habitat has serious repercussions for biodiversity. Biodiversity is defined as the variety of all forms of life from genes to species and the ecological and evolutionary processes that sustain those life forms. For example, pangolins eat up to 70 million insects per year, mostly termites, ants, and cockroaches, which regulates local pest populations and maintains soil health and crop quality for rural farmers. This is referred to as an ecosystem service or a human benefit that comes from an organism performing its role in nature. If pangolins are removed, this contributes to biodiversity loss and reduces ecosystem services. HR 864 offers several solutions to the biodiversity loss and zoonotic disease risks posed by illegal wildlife trafficking through six policy interventions illustrated in light blue on this flowchart. First, we are going to discuss the three policy interventions for biodiversity loss, namely amending existing conservation laws, funding for conservation work, and an international wildlife conservation program. HR 864 amends and expands some pre-existing legislation to protect more species. Under the bill, Fish and Wildlife Service officers can assist with conservation of species like rhinos, tigers, and African elephants. This bill also expands previous conservation legislation to include newly endangered species, such as supporting the conservation of freshwater turtles and tortoises under the Marine Turtle Conservation Act. This expanded legislation also helps combat biodiversity loss by directing the fines on wildlife traffickers to conservation and will therefore come at no added expense to taxpayers. Expanding resources for conservation will also slow biodiversity loss. This will take place on land, but also at sea to help slow illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing through amendments to the Magnuson-Stevens Conservation Act. And the slide. The last proposed solution for biodiversity loss is in the development of an international wildlife conservation program. The bill's language allows the Fish and Wildlife Service to administer assistance under existing conservation legislation. The Fish and Wildlife Service officers would focus on international conservation programs to protect the species listed on the right. Next slide. Okay. One example of effective conservation legislation comes from the American alligator in Florida. American alligators were listed as endangered in 1967 by the Endangered Species Preservation Act due to unregulated hunting to make leather from their skins. 
In the 1950s, the American alligator population was estimated at 100,000 individuals spread across the southern states. But after 12 years of protection, between 500,000 and 1 million alligators survived in Florida alone. Once American alligators were protected under the Endangered Species Preservation Act, their populations recovered to the point where they could be hunted sustainably again, supporting local economies through ecotourism. Next, we will go over the zoonotic disease components of the bill, namely the placement of Fish and Wildlife Service officers abroad, awarding whistleblowers, and increasing penalties for trafficking. The bill calls for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service officers to be stationed abroad to assist in conservation and enforcement in countries of concern. This map shows where officers are currently stationed in countries in blue. And under the bill, officers would be stationed in hotspots shown in red on the map. If these international agents are able to stem wildlife trafficking, then there are fewer opportunities for zoonotic diseases to make the jump from trafficked animals to human populations. Another important policy intervention in this bill is encouraging whistleblowing, which is the practice of criminal insiders disclosing illegal activity to law enforcement organizations. This practice provides wildlife regulators with important information about criminal organizations and helps improve enforcement. However, whistleblowers require a high reward that matches the personal risk of speaking out against dangerous organizations. This is why this bill increases whistleblower rewards to encourage more individuals to come forward with information. Additionally, organized crime is also involved with the trafficking of pangolin scales, which are pictured in this image. Given that, one more solution is to make wildlife trafficking violations much more serious crimes. This bill will amend the Travel Act and the Racketeering Statute, which will increase fines on wildlife traffickers and increase the ease of prosecutions and the severity of the penalties. However, there are several controversies with the solutions offered in this bill that we have broken up into three categories scientific, social, and geopolitical. First, I will discuss the scientific controversies. While conservation is generally effective, there are instances when conservation is an ineffective method for biodiversity protection. This is the result when regulations are poorly enforced or when conservation undermines local communities which rely on their natural surroundings for food and income. For example, conservation legislation may ban certain fishing practices to reduce bycatch of other species, but this, this ban may jeopardize local fishers' incomes. In addition to ecosystem health, conservation must support local incomes and food security while also using strong enforcement to undermine trafficking. The social controversies surrounding the bill are related to the cultural uses of wildlife products. In some cases, such as with the rhino horn trade, the wildlife product is used in traditional medicinal practices. International conservation organizations claim there is no proven benefit medicinally, but these products are so culturally ingrained. The way forward requires education, enhanced scientific investigation, and engagement with the communities that use these products. Last are the geopolitical controversies surrounding the bill. The United States can make very strict laws regarding wildlife trafficking, but in the end, these laws may only be enacted and applied to an extent. The bill may be seen as cultural imperialism as the U.S. enforces conservation values globally without regard for longstanding culture and tradition. Now we move to the question of how to measure this bill's success. Due to the inherent challenge of measuring illegal activity, indirect measurements are the primary metrics to evaluate any success. One indicator of successful conservation would be to determine biodiversity markers and population trends before conservation measures in the bill are enacted, and then again afterwards. This provides a baseline to compare against, and then the conservation intervention's effectiveness can be determined. Another way to measure success related to fines and penalties would be measuring total conservation funding after the bill's implementation and comparing it to previous funding awards. In terms of measuring zoonotic diseases, there are several options. One is to perform disease testing in wildlife markets or on animals intercepted by customs officials. And another option is to maintain a count of wildlife market closures. While it is difficult to measure the avoidance of a problem, these measures indicate falling risk levels, which is just as important. Finally, there are some common ways to directly measure the movement of traffic products, including the number, volume, or weight of seized animals. It's also pretty straightforward to track how many arrests occur as a result of whistleblowing to determine if enforcement is improved as a result of enhanced rewards. 
In closing, HR 864 is a bill that attempts to fill policy gaps to stop wildlife trafficking. By encouraging conservation and leveraging the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, among other policy interventions, the bill aims to reduce biodiversity loss, slow the global movement of wildlife, and stem the spread of zoonotic disease. Thank you. I am happy to take any questions. Okay. Very nice work. Uh, good job, Tim. Any questions from our class or guests? Right, you guys can either type them in the chat box or raise your hands. It looks like we've got one. Um, so Abigail was wondering, what metric does the bill use to measure biodiversity? So biodiversity is a complex measurement. The bill doesn't go into how to measure that, but some ways that we indicated are taking surveys of species richness. So that's counting plants, animals, and insect life in an area. There are many technical methods in the field and it gets more complicated when you consider oceanic biodiversity, but generally it includes counting the number of species and how many individuals are present and then measuring those trends over time to determine whether biodiversity is holding steady, rising or falling. Okay, very good. Other questions? If okay, we're... we have um, a hand raised from okay. Rachel. Okay. Hi, Tim. Great presentation. Um, I also had a question about measuring success um, because I think one of the metrics was uh, arrests, number, how many arrests and, and finding uh, trafficking instances there were. Um, and I'm wondering how you reconcile this the real success of the bill, which would be driving down the amount of trafficking with measuring successful enforcement of or, or finding instances of trafficking when it does occur. Okay, that's, that's a great question. Um, generally speaking, this bill has a very strong enforcement component related to the organized crime aspect of wildlife trafficking, which is very broad. And so reducing trafficking involves dismantling those criminal act or those criminal rings. And so high arrests and prosecutions indicates that the whistleblower system is working and that organized crime is being dismantled, which means that there are fewer resources and people behind trafficking. And again, as we said, it's a very complicated thing to measure because it's crime, it's clandestine. And so you have to look at it from these indirect outside measurements. And so arrest is just one of those um, that measures enforcement on the social side, not so much on the scientific side. Okay, very good. Uh, we have. One final question for our briefer. All right, Jenny has another question. Let's okay. see. Okay, Jenny. Uh, I was, wanted to know, Tim, um, would you make any amendments or your team make any amendments to the bill that would factor in what you mentioned of the cultural insensitivity or or also like, how, like, is there a measurement that could be inserted into the bill to and analyze like social impacts and make sure that there's proper like community engagement? Um, that's not something we really discussed. I will say though that the Fish and Wildlife Service officers that are placed abroad have a lot of leeway in their, in their work. So they are supposed to work with NGOs and with government organizations abroad and with communities. And so a lot of it really depends on how the director of the agency and how the people overseeing outreach and conservation develop these programs. So a lot of it is on the implementation side, not so much on the legislative side. So I think it's really important that the director takes that into consideration but it's not something that we've talked about as an amendment to the bill. Okay, all right, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you for a great presentation.
Uh, let's give him a virtual hand, everybody. And uh, I think what we'll do now, it is now uh, 1045. We're going to take a five minute break. And at 1050, we will resume uh, with uh, Griffin's briefing. Okay. So everybody, let's take five. Okay, we'll resume in about a minute. Okay, welcome back everyone uh, to the 
final two final briefings uh, of the semester. Uh, our next um, uh, briefer is uh, Griffin Smith, uh, who will be briefing us on the Department of Defense Climate Resiliency and Readiness Act. Um, and if you're ready, uh, Griffin, take it away. Uh, thank you, Professor Cohen. Um, good morning. My name is Griffin Smith. And before I begin, I just wanted to relay my appreciation for my team, um, which is comprised of a group of intelligent, passionate environmentalists uh, who choose to remain hopeful and optimistic in these times. I feel privileged for the opportunity to present our research on a bill that was introduced in the House of Representatives last May, HR 2759, Department of Defense Climate Resiliency and Readiness Act. This proposed legislation, which I will refer to as the DOD Climate Act, is an opportunity for the federal government to invest in both the military and the environment. The United Nations has declared climate change the defining problem of our time. We currently face a direct existential threat. In this presentation, I will review the objectives of the proposed legislation. And in the event that our elected representatives in, in Congress move past the denial of climate change, I will define the legislation's success. I hope to convey three points this morning. Climate change is currently threatening installations and operations of the DOD. Adaptations are currently available that will enhance the DOD's readiness and that this proposed legislation will assist the DOD in mitigating its climate risks. The unfortunate reality is that climate change is currently threatening installations and operations of the DOD. Military installations at home and abroad are currently at risk. Three of these images show the aftermath of extreme weather events fueled by our changing climate. And one of them reminds us of the looming threat posed to our coastal installations. The DOD Climate Act has five objectives which intend to enhance the readiness of our military. It's important to note here that the DOD Climate Act is crafted with national security in mind. This legislation does not apply to tactical aspects of the military. The focus of the DOD Climate Act is on non-operational sources, that is the fixed installations and the enduring locations of the DOD. So we'll, we'll first begin by looking at the current climate threats to installations and operations of the DOD. The DOD understands the need to incorporate extreme weather and other effects of climate change into its planning and its risk management. Across the nation, installations report, report vulnerabilities from two or more factors of climate change. These assets of the DOD are affected by uh, severe weather events ranging from storm surge, wildfires in California, high winds, uh, and they may be affected by sea level rise in the future. In fact, there are 1,700 military installations that are at risk of sea level rise. Earth Institute scientist and climate activist James Hansen has watched his dire predictions for the planet come true. Since 1986, humans have increased atmospheric carbon dioxide by 45% and our planet has warmed by about two degrees Fahrenheit. This recent trend of increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide can be best seen in the graph. Dr. Hansen noted that the consensus is clear. There is no natural factor that can account for this. Uh, humans are the cause of global warming and human activity has altered the composition of our global atmosphere. It certainly is difficult to think about a shift away from burning fossil fuels uh, and the period of transition will be very messy and uncertain. However, the decision to continue to burn fossil fuels will result in large scale climate change this century and beyond. So let's discuss the current adaptations that are available uh, that could enhance the DOD's readiness. For government action to be effective, the Department of Defense must be able to uniformly assess the risks of climate change at each installation. The DOD Climate Act requires the department to create a vulnerability 
um, and risk assessment tool. This tool will be consistent with the prevailing scientific consensus um, and it will allow for a uniform quantitative assessment. We need to truly understand the extent of these climate threats. Previous vulnerability assessments were qualitative and were self-reported by individuals at these installations. There is no uniform measure that has currently um, been implemented. The DOD Climate Act directs Mark Esper, the secretary of the department, to use this tool to rank military installations from most to least vulnerable. The goal here is to increase the readiness of our military and to ensure continued operational viability. Today, the DOD remains largely dependent on a commercial power grid. This power grid is vulnerable to disruption from extreme weather, aging infrastructure, and direct attack. By installing microgrids, like the one seen here at Lakeland Air Force Base, the Department of Defense pursues energy security and energy resilience. The solutions set forth in this proposed legislation will assist the DOD in mitigating its climate risks. To mitigate its risks, the DOD must simply reduce its carbon footprint. The DOD must first pledge energy efficiency, and then it must measure its progress towards reducing its overall energy use. By the end of this decade, the DOD must strive to produce energy locally, to produce as much renewable energy as is consumed. Net zero energy will be achieved through the allocation of research dollars and the development of electric grid technology and the implementation of renewable energy projects at installations. In 2010, the Army's Net Zero Initiative la launched 17 pilot installations that were meant to model the sustainable path forward, a path towards operational energy security. One of these um, net zero sites is on the Marshall Islands at an installation that is only 10 feet above sea level. What excites our group most about our research is the purchasing power of the Department of Defense and the money that flows to our military and to its contractors. What if the DOD were to pivot and pivot towards renewable, pivot on the climate, our country has a long history of energy innovation that has been spurred from investments in the name of military necessity. The Department of Defense Investment in Advanced Technology is a force multiplier that will continue to spur energy innovation. The truth is that energy will always be vital for our national security and that much of the innovation potential lies with zero and low zero carbon sources. Last year, it was estimated that the department invested $1.6 billion in energy research, development, testing, and evaluation. The Climate Act calls for there to be increased research dollars allocated to the development of microgrids and electric grid technology. Now I thought we could take a look at one installation uh, that is part of the Army's Net Zero Initiative. In 2011, a hybrid microgrid was installed at Fort Carson in Colorado. So it's a hybrid microgrid project. So it's not net zero yet, uh, but it's progress nonetheless. This system contains one megawatt solar PV array, three generators, and a 4.5 megawatt battery storage system. This hybrid microgrid system has increased energy efficiency at this installation and provides an adequate power supply. Looking ahead, this uh, system hopes to become more renewable by adding wind, heat pumps, uh, and biofuels to, its, to the hybrid grid. The DOD must continue to make progress like this uh, and take prudent steps to reduce its carbon footprint. So the DOD Climate Act will be successful if the department is able to demonstrate increased readiness to respond to climate threats and also 100% net zero energy by 2030. After pledging to increase its energy efficiency, the DOD must measure its progress in reducing carbon dioxide emissions at each installation. Our research has found uh, that the technology is available. 
the transition to net zero energy is feasible. The, the Department of Defense accounts for 70% of the federal government's annual energy consumption. Imagine the change that could occur, that would occur, if the DOD were to pivot on the climate. What if the DOD were to apply its full purchasing power towards the U.S. renewable energy market? With this presentation, I hope to have highlighted our group's research and the importance of investments that enhance our military. Our research should suggest that these investments are in the interest of the nation. We remain optimistic and hopeful that the DOD, by pivoting on the climate and pivoting towards renewable, will reduce the risks that it's aiming to build resilience against. We thank you for your time and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Very good job. Uh, thank you. Do we have any questions for a briefer? You guys can raise your hand or type them in the chat box. Oh, we got a question. Rachel has a question. Hey. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Hi, Griffin. Great presentation. Um, I just had a quick question um, because you said that the DOD accounts for 70% of federal government energy consumption, and this bill is specifically focused on non-operational sources. So what's the breakdown of how much is used for non-operational versus operational sources? That's, that's a great question. Um, I don't have the exact... Um, the exact percentage uh, here, uh, but we, we do know um, that it, it is a very, very, very large uh, number uh, of megawatts of British, British thermal units is that they, they measure it in. Um, but I don't have the exact number for you. Um, I remember during our research, uh, we, were, we were blown away um, by, by the DOD's energy. Um, and um, Yes, I'm sorry I don't have the exact number for you, but, but what I can tell you is that the DOD's energy uh, footprint is larger than two individual countries. Um, and then within that, uh, most of its energy consumption is, is for fuel and for uh, providing electricity for its buildings. And because this bill focuses on non-operational installations, which are its buildings, uh, it, it is a very large amount of energy. Great. Okay. We have two more questions. Um, one is from an attendee. Um, they ask, does this bill include any measures to build resilience in DOD facilities that are at risk of being impacted by climate change, even with emissions reductions? Yes. So the whole, the whole idea here is that the military will fortify its installations from climate threats uh, all over the country and then also take steps to reduce the climate threats. So they are going to fortify its installations uh, while also taking steps to reduce its footprint so that the climate threats become less severe. Okay, uh, why don't we take one final question? Great, last question from Liz. Um, she says, great presentation. To what extent does the DOD already implement renewable energy and microgrids? So uh, I, I showed one example um, we talked a little bit about one example, but we have, the Army has a net zero initiative project that is currently um, across the nation. Uh, and, and the DOD is making great progress here. I think that what our call is, is that we should build on the progress that's already been made and continue to implement more of these projects. Um, so there is, a, there is a documented history here of successful DOD renewable energy projects. And because uh, the military has um, the ability to invest in these projects, we are calling, this legislation is calling for there to be more implementation of renewable energy, increased uh, research and development um, so that we can, you know, harness the military's power towards renewable. Okay, Griffin, thank you very much. Very nice job. Uh, and, uh, why don't we now move to our final, final briefing. I think this time Drew really will be doing it on uh, Water Power Research and Development Act, uh, which was advised by Professor Apson.
So let's move to our final, final briefing. Awesome. Um, cool. Good morning and good evening. My name is Drew Poling, and I'm here to present the final briefing for the potential power team on HR 6084, the Water Power Research and Development Act. Now, before I begin, I want to say thank you to our manager and deputy manager, Liz Wilson and Colleen Neely, as well as my team members, Anna Nikolova and Carol Hugh, who worked with me on this output. Finally, I want to say thank you to Professor Apson for his support and guidance, both on this output and throughout the entire summer workshop. To preview what I'll be covering today, I'm going to start by introducing the bill, then move into the problems that this bill addresses, explain the funding priorities for the bill, then cover the solutions put forward, as well as the different forms of water power technologies utilized. Finally, I'll describe how HR 6084 can guide the US towards a more just energy sector. This bill, introduced by Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, funds the expansion of research and development efforts for water power te technologies. The two main types of water power technologies are hydropower, shown in the top photo of the CARE Dam, and marine energy shown in the bottom photo here with a power buoy off of New Jersey's coast. The implementation of these technologies will reduce the need for highly polluting fossil fuels to provide electricity across the United States, provide a new source of job and revenue growth for coastal communities by commercializing marine technologies, and also address the current impacts that existing hydropower dams have on their surrounding communities and ecosystems. One of the problems this bill addresses is the current dependence on fossil fuel energy sources. As the graph shows, coal and natural gas made up the majority of 2019 energy, gener energy generation with 61% of the national total together. These energy sources greatly impact the health of neighboring communities as well. Due to the proximity of coal-fired power plants, minority groups experience 38% higher levels of nitrogen dioxide pollution and additionally, childhood asthma rates are twice as high in black communities for the same reason. Regarding natural gas, production has actually increased by 60% over the past decade. And this American shale revolution has run new pipeline projects through low-income communities, communities of color and across indigenous lands. The second problem addressed is the need for further research and development in the marine energy sector. As marine energy technologies are still in an early stage of development, in the United States, they require government funding to become competitive. Finally, aging dam infrastructure is in desperate need of attention across the country, with 17% of current standing dams having high hazard potential. These existing projects require attention to mitigate any risk of collapsing infrastructure. Here we have a case study of the Dalles Dam, which is located on the Columbia River in Oregon. This project generates 1,878 megawatts of electricity. However, this run of river dam also shows the history of environmental injustice related to the construction of hydroelectric dams. The Columbia River has historically been a central part of life for the Yakima, Umatilla, Nez Perce, and Warm Springs tribes. Most specifically, Celilo Falls, located on the river, was a hub for fishing and trading where tribes as far away as Alaska and the Dakotas would come to take part. When construction of the Dalles Dam finished in 1957, this area, which had been historically inhabited for 10,000 years, was slowly flooded. The loss of Celilo Falls came with the loss of traditional Native American fishing sites, sacred areas, burial sites, and homes. While dams generate cheap renewable electricity, they significantly impact surrounding communities and ecosystems. This illustrates a main reason that the future of water power technology relies on the commercialization of marine technologies. That future is further understood in the funding distribution of the bill, which is shown in this graphic here. 75% of the total funding goes toward the research and development of marine technologies, with hydropower receiving the remaining percentage. With this needed funding for marine energy development, grants will be awarded to institutions of higher education to expand ongoing work at national marine energy centers. These centers work to further research, development, demonstration, testing, and commercial application activities of marine energy technologies. Additionally, new centers will be established to further this commercialization effort. Now, while marine energy is the main focus, hydropower technologies are the only currently commercialized aspect of water power energy in the United States. Here are two examples of existing hydropower dams. 
We have a traditional impoundment dam, which can be seen in the photo on the left, showing the Hoover Dam, uh, which generates electricity through falling water. The photo on the right shows the K-Stick pump storage plant in Los Angeles County. Now, pump storage plants mainly provide energy during times of peak demand. A third form of hydropower is called run of river or diversion, which was shown with the Dallas Dam previously. For hydropower, a main goal of this bill is to improve and retrofit existing dams instead of promoting the construction of new hydropower projects due to the aforementioned community and environmental impacts. Due to the lack of development, marine energy is the main focus for this bill. While marine technologies are not yet commercialized in the United States, there are established sources of tidal energy and wave energy globally. Each of these technologies generate energy by harnessing the power behind waves and currents. The photo on the left shows a tidal energy turbine from the West Islay Tidal Farm, located off the coast of Northern Ireland. The photo on the right shows a wave energy uh, platform from the Triton Wave Energy Converter, created by Oscilla Power, which is a Seattle-based company. Now, unlike wave and tidal energy, salinity gradient technologies have yet to be commercialized anywhere. Salinity gradient power has the potential to produce a constant and efficient flow of energy through chemical pressure differentials created between freshwater and saltwater, which is shown in the diagram on the left. The Mississippi Delta, shown on the right, would be a possible location for a salinity project. And in fact, most estuaries have the potential to produce salinity gradient power, as the main prerequisite is the mixing of freshwater and saltwater. It's projected that if scaled, this technology could produce up to 7% of the global energy demand. Ocean thermal energy conversion is the final marine energy technology I'll be covering today. And it generates energy by utilizing temperature differences between ocean surface waters and deep ocean waters, which is shown in the diagram here. These plants can be either onshore or offshore, typically dependent on the size of the plant being tested. While ocean thermal energy conversion technology is still being developed, there is a functioning plant at a National Marine Energy Center on Hawaii's Kona Coast, which is shown in the photo on the right. It was connected to Hawaii's grid in August of 2015, generating 100 kilowatts of energy to local homes. While construction of a plant that could generate 100 megawatts, powering 120,000 homes is possible, currently size and cost limitations stand in the way of implementation. In measuring the success of this bill, the short-term metrics considered are the rate of commercialization for marine energy, the decreased environmental impact of water power technologies, and any improvement in grid reliability as a result. Together, these metrics work to achieve the ultimate outcome of the bill, diversifying the energy mix away from highly polluting fossil fuel sources, such as the Philadelphia oil refinery shown here. This refinery exploded in 2019, enveloping the surrounding and predominantly African-American community in 5,000 pounds of hydrofluoric acid, a deadly pollutant. Further research into this catastrophe found that the refinery was also releasing benzene unreported into the air at 21 times the safe federal limit for years. In renovating the national energy system, the communities most impacted by our existing energy sources need to be considered first. Low-income households and communities of color are more likely to live in proximity to polluting industries such as coal-fired power plants, oil refineries, and pipeline infrastructure, forcing their exposure to harmful levels of, of air pollution and unsafe drinking water. At its intersection, our demand to end the era of fossil fuels must be rooted in equity and the protection and realization of human rights. This bill can address each of these issues if implemented correctly, and it is necessary to include minority serving institutions and tribal entities in the research and development efforts going forward. With the ability to decrease national dependence on highly polluting energy sources and jumpstart a potentially $900 billion marine energy industry, this bill can take major steps towards creating an equitable and sustainable energy future for the United States. With that, I'd like to give a huge thank you to the entire potential power team for all of their hard work this summer. It's really been a pleasure working with everyone and I look forward to continue doing so in the fall. And again, would like to thank Professor Absent for his leadership throughout the whole summer on this project. With that, I'll take any questions and thank you for your time. Very good job, nice work. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, class or from uh, anybody who's observing. Okay, I see something popping up in the box there. Great. So we have a question for from Maya. 
Um, could you explain a little bit a little bit on the potential impacts of marine energy on coastal communities? Yeah, um, that's definitely a great question. And as I mentioned, the development of marine energy technologies has the potential to improve the economy for a lot of those areas. Um, one case study that we were looking at uh, was in Nova Scotia, which found that if they installed a 150 turbine array, it would bring 22,000 new full-time jobs to the area and over a 25 year period, increase the GDP by around 1.7 billion as well. Um, and additionally, an array of this size would likely avoid the emissions of 129,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, um, 17,000 tons of nitrous, nitrous, nitrous oxide, excuse me, um, and 9.6 million tons of carbon dioxide um, over about the same time period. Um, so really the, the benefits are there if we can scale these uh, technologies. Great, we have another question from Jenny. Great presentation, and I really appreciate the, the focus on equity. Um, on that note, how much does the bill integrate, um, or is it mostly through existing laws, and this might be more implementation, but of like looking at community impacts of the proposed projects? Is it like through NEPA, or would it, it does the actual bill factor in um, like social impacts in addition to environmental? Yeah, so the bill doesn't specify who they'll be working with directly when implementing these technologies. I think a bit of the reason for that is because um, the first step is making sure they can be developed and scaled to provide energy effectively um, at a, a commercialized uh, level. Um, one thing that there is clear language on is working with um, institutions that they haven't historically been working with. So making sure that minority serving institutions and tribal entities are included in this type of development process. Um, but I do think going forward, the bill has a lack of specificity for how exactly it will be implemented, which um, really gives it the potential to be implemented correctly and justly or not so. And that's why going forward, it needs to be done the right way to have the desired impacts. Okay. We have a, a third question. Nobody has raised their hands. Okay, well, if not, then uh, let me uh, thank you for a very good job and thank all of our briefers today for uh, really uh, doing an amazing job of summarizing some very complex proposals and bills uh, in a very short period of time. So let me just conclude today by talking a little bit about what does come next. Uh, just as uh, we just heard about this water bill, uh, next semester is all about how do we make this real? Uh, and you'll see uh, in most bills, especially something as complicated as environmental issues, there's a great deal of room for what we call administrative discretion. Uh, some things are designated, some things are laid out. Uh, but then sometimes uh, there's a certain vagueness and sometimes even things that are specific when you get operational uh, become less specific. One of the things that we're going to be doing in the fall semester as we develop implementation plans for these bills is what's called cutting the problem down to size. Uh, we're going to have to figure out uh, how do we make this program real uh, and where do we start? You can't do everything at once. Uh, the first day of January when this, uh, of 2021, when these program implementation plans begin, you suddenly don't have 150 new people show up at the office and say, well, let's get to work. Uh, you've got to first develop a plan for what you're going to do and how you're going to ramp up um, and, and how the programs are going to uh, become uh, implemented uh, over the long run. Um, this whole idea of going from a policy idea, which is what a bill is, first understanding its basics and the science, which we've done through the summer, uh, is central to the curriculum in our program. So we're gonna, we've done that uh, this summer. Then in the fall, we're gonna ask questions like, well, we're actually gonna step out of our simulation for a little bit and say, what would it take to actually get these bills passed? What is, what is the political calculus that would make this real? 
and then we're going to assume somehow miraculously this all happens uh, and these bills are passed. Although I have to say there hasn't been very much new environmental legislation over the last uh, three decades or so, but we're going to assume that that's going to all change next year. And so how do we make this real? Um, how do we go from uh, concept to reality? How do we create managed programs? And we're going to again continue to do it in groups. The same groups will be uh, convening in the fall semester. We'll have new managers and deputy managers. Uh, and we'll continue this process. So I, again, I, I ask those of you who've been in the class to step back for a moment and think about how much you've learned about these problems and these programs. And it's been learned by us learning together, uh, sharing with each other, teaching each other, uh, doing research and sending it to other people in the team, uh, building on each other's strengths. This is a cross disciplinary field that requires a lot of different kinds of disciplines different kinds of knowledge to address these problems. So I'm looking forward to the fall semester. Uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to finishing the summer and getting a little bit of a break. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, be meeting again uh, together to see what we can do to make these bills real. So again, uh, have a, a great uh, rest of your morning uh, and rest of semester. And we will be meeting again at the beginning of the next semester. Congratulations to all of our groups and to all of our briefers today. And Stephanie, thank you for organizing all of this. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie.